Hi, I'm Steve Barsh from DreamIt, and today I wanted to take you through some really advanced techniques that we love entrepreneurs to use that really shows you how to break through via email. So much communications you're going to be doing with customers and investors is via email, and we find most people are really not that great at it. So we want to show you some great techniques that we've developed over the years to help you break through and get those meetings and important discussions started that you really want. The goal of this presentation is get you to be an email ninja. So this presentation and discussion is based off of some observations uh, going into this whole discussion. First, most people will openly complain that the amount of email they get is just absolutely overwhelming. Um, and it's really, we find, unlikely to get a response from someone if they really don't know you. If you're sending a cold email, just so many people get so much email, they tend to not be likely to respond. Also, people don't know how to get an email opened, read, and acted upon. So these three critical things, we want to make sure when you're sending an email that it's going to get opened by the reader, they're actually going to read it and take the action that you're looking for. So when breaking through on email, the first thing you need to do is break the ice. So before you're even going to email, we want you to establish some name recognition with the recipient. So before you're going to send an email, we want you to do some things in advance. The first thing that we think is really important to do is send a LinkedIn invitation to connect. So what you're going to do is you're going to link in with them on LinkedIn, then you're going to send your email. Now, if you're going to be using LinkedIn, and I'm sure you're going to be using it, a couple of important things. First of all, remember to make sure that your LinkedIn profile is very rich. Is your picture there and is it sometime from within the last five or ten years that it actually looks like you? Are all of your positions there? Are the descriptions really thorough? All of your roles really thorough? Your educational information? You want to make sure that profile looks really rich because you're going to start putting this social capital to work. Additionally, you want to connect like mad on LinkedIn. So we spend a lot of time at DreamIt. We're always linking in because the more people you link into, let's say you're a healthcare company, you're an ed tech company, and somebody receives a LinkedIn invitation and they see they have three or four people in common with you, it's much more likely they're going to link back to you. So you start building that energy within LinkedIn. Also, when you're going to send a LinkedIn invitation, a really critical point is you need to make sure that you send a relevant and specific introductory note. If you see the example up on the screen, this just isn't the, hey, I'd like to link in with you on LinkedIn. It's a very specific note that we've written to make sure that this person responds to this request. We find your acceptance rate on LinkedIn skyrockets when you do things like this. An important note about LinkedIn and sending LinkedIn requests like this is we find today that if you use the apps on an iPhone or an Android device and you just say, oh, I want to connect, it automatically sends the LinkedIn invitation and you have no opportunity to do a custom message like this. Currently, you must use the web platform of LinkedIn to do these custom messages. And again, we find that it makes your invitations very, very effective. Additional things that you can do to break the ice with people before you even send, again, before you send your first email, follow them on Twitter, you comment on the blog, you're doing all of these things before you send your email, so they're going to know about you before you send the actual email for the meeting that you want or the introduction that you want. As many of you may realize, if you're going to connect with them on LinkedIn, how do you know what their email address is? Because LinkedIn will say, how do you want to connect? And it'll say like other, and you put in their email address. Where do you get their email address? Now, a lot of DreamIt companies, once they get kind of into the DreamIt way, almost it's like a challenge of ripping the ears off the bull. They won't even say, they'll say, you know, don't even give me the email address. I'm going to figure it out for myself. And it's really pretty easy. So you can do it by the contact info tab on LinkedIn. Sometimes people will put their email address right on LinkedIn, and you can use that to unlock and link in with them. You can search for their uh, CV or their resume. Um, there are a number of contact search tools that you can use. Uh, data.com is one of them, and there's all kinds of cell hack, there are all kinds of tools to get email addresses. Um, one technique I tend to use a lot is I follow the format of other people's email addresses at a company or institution, and I use a, an add-in called Reportive, which is like a Google Chrome add-in. If you put the email address in, it'll show you if it's the correct email address, so it'll resolve it for you. Or you can try things like Twitter name, Gmail, Yahoo, and take their Twitter name and just add a Gmail or Yahoo because you're looking for their email address. Again, because if you're trying to break the ice via LinkedIn, you need their email address to actually send that contact request. 
Again, I find most of the people at Dream It, 95% of their time in a minute or less, they can figure out what that person's email address is. So even if you don't have a warm intro, you can self-intro using these techniques and starting with LinkedIn. Now that we've talked about how to break the ice with things like LinkedIn, let's talk about actually sending the actual email. The first step in sending a really great email is making sure that you have a super compelling subject line. Let's review some do's and don'ts of having great subject lines because if you don't have a great subject line and no one ever opens your email, it's all for naught. So let's talk about some don'ts first. The first thing in the don'ts is don't be uh, a generic and nondescript. I get emails all day long. It says intro or introduction or referral and it's really kind of generic. They tend to get opened less and we find that a true across the entire community of Dreamit companies that if you send these really weak emails, they get very little to no response because they're never opened if the subject line is really not compelling. Don't ever leave an email subject line blank. My personal rule is if you send me a blank subject line email, I just delete it. So make sure that you don't do these things. So let's make sure that you, you do the good ones on the other side of the slide. So some of the really critical things, first of all, in, in the do side, Make sure that you have a really newsworthy hook in the subject line of your email. What's compelling about it? What's interesting that I should open your email? Think of it almost like writing a headline at a news organization. What's that newsworthy hook? And what's that strong reason to open your email? A lot of times what we'll do at Dreamit and suggest that companies do is they start with the recipient's name in the beginning of the subject line so they know it's that recipient's action. Just to go a little further on that, what I'm talking about there is I've seen a lot of large organizations, they'll have five people on the two line, 10 people on the CC line, and nobody really knows if they have to open the email and deal with it. So one of the things that we love to do is I'll actually put the person's name, like in the example below, it says Bono, referred by Despina. Bono is the person's name. It's right in the beginning of that subject line so they know it's their action to open. The last thing that we like to do is if you're doing a referral, or you're, you're going through a referral, make sure to add the referrer's name. Again, like in the subject example that you see below, Bono, referred by Despina. We're putting that in there because we want to make sure that the subject line is compelling, it's credible, and it'll have a high open rate so we can break through to this individual contact that we're trying to reach out to. The last thing I wanted to point out is realize that about uh, over 50% of the time, the first place your email is going to land is on someone's smartphone. And if it lands on someone's smartphone, that compelling subject line is even more critical. So think about that on a smartphone, you'll usually only see about the first 30 characters of the subject line of that email address. You're just one finger swipe away from getting deleted for your email. So just think about when you're sending an email, you want a really compelling subject line, those first 30 or so characters are really, really critical to make sure that email is gonna get opened, actioned upon, and most importantly, not deleted or not ignored. Now that we've talked about how to break the ice and have a really compelling subject line, let's get into the body of the email itself and make sure you have a killer, killer, short email body. One of the first things you want to do quickly within your email is establish credibility with that audience. I'm assuming this is someone that you barely know or it's a light reference or a light referral that you got, so credibility is really important. How can you establish credibility? You could talk about companies you've already met with, investors that you've possibly already met with, people that are trialing your software, your solution at a university or healthcare system. Measurable milestones, you could say, I'm a startup, we've been doing this for a year and we already have 150,000 users, but there's different ways of getting credibility. Think about what gives you the most credibility for your audience. Next, think about putting in a really concise overview. It's almost like your elevator pitch, inside an email, but it's really, really concise. What's important is that first line of your email, those first one or two sentences or three sentences are really important. You want to make this very short and very concise and to the point. You can also consider something that I'll do a lot and we see at Dream It a lot is where people bluff in their email. What a bluff is in this case, what that acronym means is bottom line up front. So a lot of times you'll see people send these really long emails and at the very bottom is what the actual action item is. Sometimes we'll put that bottom line right up front at the very top of the email. Establish credibility and then get to the point and then put the supporting material after it. So you can consider that, especially if the email is a little bit longer. Now, some other things I want you to think about. Think about your email from the recipient's point of view. Not your point of view, but the recipient's point of view. So, 
what's in it for them, right? That's a WIFM statement. So you're sending this email and a lot of times I'll get an email saying, I want to pick your brain or can I get some of your time? And one of the things that runs through my mind is, what's in it for me? And I don't do that as much or try to be really giving of my time. But if you're trying to get to a high profile executive, a really busy person, you need to give a reason for what's in it for them to meet with you. Make sure it's uh, equal um, and not lopsided that it's just all for you. You can use something like a FOMO function. If you know what that is, that's the fear of missing out. Look, we've already met with Walmart, we've met with Target, and we've met with Amazon. We're hoping you could give us a few minutes of your time. We'd like to talk to you about our new Internet of Things and, and what it's doing in this space. So you could try to use a FOMO technique where they think like they're going to miss the, the next great thing, the next big thing. Then the last area I want you to think about is what's the ask? So a lot of times I'll get an email and I see other people send email and there's no clear ask at the bottom. Or do you want a meeting? Are you looking to invest? Are you looking for advice? What is that ask? So make sure when you write a great email body, you hit these critical, critical points in here. That you have credibility, you have a very concise, tight overview, and that you think about it from the audience's point of view. You stand in their shoes and try to read it from their point of view. Now I mentioned this on the last slide, and I just want to bring this up. This is an expression I really, really dislike. I get emails every single week. Hey Steve, was hoping I could get a half hour of your time. I'd really like to pick your brain. I just really don't like that expression because it's the most one-sided, lopsided meeting I can ever think of. So you're going to pick my brain. That sounds great. Um, not, right? What's in it for me? So I would highly suggest don't send emails to people that say, can I pick your brain? because it's completely one-sided, it's lopsided. Make sure you have a really clear statement of why they should meet with you, what's in it for them. Now, when writing the text of your email, just some language zen I want you to think about to make sure that your email is very clear and very easily read. Try to trim long, hard to read sentences, really try to be concise and to the point. Avoid too many adverbs, it's something I have to be careful about, I get all excited and I do adverb after adverb. Avoid too many adverbs. Use the active voice instead of the passive voice. If you don't remember that from your, your high school level of English or high school English, um, just look it up. You want active voice in your emails. And try to be careful of highfalutin language where you're using so much inside baseball terminology, nobody really understands uh, what it means. Um, and there's websites like Hemingway.com and other websites and services out there that you can throw an email into if it's really, really critical. Um, and it'll give you feedback on the quality of the text. If it's a really important email, what I'll do is I'll typically go to somebody I trust a lot and say, could you give this a quick read and tell me what you think, if it's a really critical email to a high-level contact. So just some thoughts on you've built this great concise body, just make sure the language is well-tuned before you send it. Now I think what most people really don't like when they get an email is when they get an email that's this long, and if you know the acronym TLDR, too long, didn't read. It's like the email is so overwhelming, all you want to do is delete it. Or you open it and you say, oh my goodness, this looks like a lot of work, I'll read it later. And I find that most people, over 50% of the time, never get back to the email. It just sits and rots in their inbox. So some tricks to think about to make sure those emails are really concise. So try to bullet information where it's appropriate. It makes it much easier for the reader. It tends to help you write in a much more shorter format so you can bullet the information. So before sending the email, one of the things I'll do a lot of times is I'll actually take the email and try to cut 50% of the text out. And I find a lot of times I can do that. I can really get it concise because I find the shorter the email it is, the higher the likelihood that actually somebody is going to take action on it. Another technique is I'll use what I call smartphone mode. So I'll take my email. We, we talked about this earlier, right? Assume 50% of your emails are going to be read on someone's smartphone. And I'll take it and I'll take a Gmail or another application and I'll take and I'll shrink the windows size down so it's about the width of a smartphone and see how it visually looks. Because remember on a smartphone it's going to look much longer because you have a narrower screen. So really, really try to cut it down and look what it's going to look like on a mobile platform. And then I try to cut it in half again. Really, really try to get it down to its essence. And it's actually a really tricky to do. If you want to get your point across in as few words as possible, you need to be a better writer to do that. So I keep just trying to trim it and cut it in half and make it as tight and small as possible. Okay, let's review where we are in this whole uh, presentation. So we talked about using products like LinkedIn to break the ice. 
write a really killer compelling subject line, have a great email body that's concise, has credibility, talks about what's in it for your audience. Let's not forget the bottom of the email, your signature. I find it's another area where a lot of early stage entrepreneurs and a lot of people in general are very, very weak in their signature. So generally, your signature should be between three to seven lines. It shouldn't just say sent from an iPad or sent from Outlook. The essentials I like to see in a signature, make sure your name and title are in there, your company name is in there, your email address is in there, and probably one of the most important things I find that's missing is your phone number. Make sure to put your phone number in international format. So if you're a US company, that means plus one. You're gonna find that when you're building an early stage company, you're gonna deal with other people that are all around the world. So if you don't put plus one, they actually don't know how to reach you or if they wanna text you. So make sure to put it in international format. One of the big reasons is it seems a lot of times if I'm running to a meeting or trying to get a hold of someone and I'm scrambling and I need to text them or let them know I'm gonna be late or I need to adjust where we're gonna meet and you're scrambling looking for their phone number, if it was just in their email signature, it makes it so much easier. So be easy to reach. Remember, you're trying to make this easy on the audience, not on you, but on the audience to reach you. So the nice thing about that signature is you wanna also have the ability to cut and paste that signature or link from it directly. So that just means this isn't an image, it's not a JPEG of your signature, it's just plain old text that somebody can copy and paste into their contact tracking system or into other systems. So that next point, same thing I'm building upon. No images, no attachments. The reason why is when I find people put logos in an email as some type of image, and then it shows up that the email has an attachment in it, I find that that decreases the open rate of email, and there's not much value of adding your logo in there, so skip it. So it doesn't look like your email has an attachment which lowers the open rate. And this is all about getting your emails opened and actioned upon. So no attachments in your email address. Also, you can put in your email to promote timely events, news, or et cetera, like see us at South by Southwest, or we'll be at CES, or we're gonna be at HIMSS for the next conference. And you can certainly put that in your email, talk about what booth you're gonna be in, any important news you can certainly put in your email signature. Okay, so great, so we have this great killer email. Now, when do we actually send it? So it's something to think about. Think about when downtime is gonna be for your audience. Right? So when are they gonna be active, for instance, on social media that would be an optimal time to send them? So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll aim for midweek as a time to send an email before or after lunch, right? They've just come back from lunch, they're just about to go, so those time sequences or those times of day are probably best to send it. Think about, by the way, think about the recipient, not you. It's not when you're going to lunch, it's when they're going to lunch in Palo Alto or they're going to lunch in Paris or Tel Aviv. So just think about the time zone that you're sending it to. The last thing to think about is I notice a tendency of a lot of executives I deal with do a lot of email Sunday evenings between six and 10 o'clock at night. I find I can break through an email very successfully on Sunday evenings. You have to see what works for you, but just try to think about what's the best time of day so your email doesn't get buried between and behind 90 other emails. Okay, so you've written a great email, you've sent it at the right time, you get a response and you're trying to set up a meeting or a call. Let's talk about specifically how to set those and how to keep driving the conversation forward. So if you're trying to get a meeting or a call, a couple of rules of thumb that we use at DreamIt and we highly suggest you use as well. If you're asking for a meeting, just ask for 15 to 20 minutes of people's time maximum. Don't ask for an hour, don't ask for a half hour. The less time you ask for, the higher likelihood that they're going to say yes. Remember, this is mostly for initial meetings and initial discussions, so keep that time window really short. And I find 20 minute meetings, you can get an enormous amount accomplished, so don't ask for a large commitment of time. We also generally find if the meeting is going well, that 20 minutes easily becomes 30 or 40 minutes. So just make the ask as small as possible. Offer specific dates and times in your email. Again, I'm trying to be very um, cognizant of how much work I'm putting on the recipient. I'm trying to make their life as easy as possible to say yes. So we'll sit there and offer two or three exact days and times of when to meet. Because if I do it the other way around saying, hey, it would be terrific to meet, I'd love to get your opinion on things, please let me know what works for you. Now I'm putting the work on them. I find people find it much easier to respond and say yes, yes, or no to certain dates and times. So make sure to offer specific dates and times in your email. Be careful to be indicate the times based on the location of the audience. 
We talked about things like this before. So at Dream It, we're talking to people all around the world all the time. Is it Eastern Time, Central Time, Central European Time, Pacific Time, and put the abbreviation in the actual time of the email because people might get confused. For international audiences, when you're suggesting dates, be really careful to spell out the date to avoid confusion. So what I'm talking about there is, I'll see people in the United States that aren't as used to working in Europe or Asia or other parts of the world, and they'll write things like 6-3. Well, is that June the 3rd or March the 6th? So spell out the name of the month, March 6th, June 3rd, to make sure you're crystal clear on exactly the dates you're talking about. So we've been putting a lot of information into these emails. We've talked about writing a great email. Now we're talking about getting those meetings and calls. And the more of this advice you follow, the more successful you're going to be in getting your emails open and getting those meetings and calls that you're looking for that are going to completely make or break your business. And we find Dream It companies use these techniques again and again to extreme success to help open up doors and get the meetings they need. Now the next concept I wanted to talk to you about, and some of you may see Dream It people doing this with you all the time, is we tend to modify subject lines. So as the conversation is going back and forth and people are replying to each other, we start tweaking the subject lines and adjusting what they say. The reason we do that is we want to keep the email moving along. We also want to make sure in products like Google, you know when it groups conversations and you can't tell, wait, have I looked at all the current emails? Am I one behind? We want to break out of the conversation mode. And if you change the subject line, Products like Google and other email products won't group them together because it's a dissimilar subject line. So we'll slightly modify so we can break it out of the conversation mode and make sure our emails are standing out. Key point, we want to make the action and next step extremely obvious at the start of that email subject line, which by the way is really important again if you're sending something to uh, that's going to be open on a smartphone. So we'll put in there in that first 30 characters, what's that next step? So maybe the first email was just about an introduction and a warm referral we got, and now we're starting to change up the subject line and say, you know, are you available on this date at this time, question mark, and put a little chevron in there. So we'll actually modify the subject line to keep moving the conversation along. We find this is highly effective. This person basically will know as the email keeps progressing exactly what that next email is about and what the next step is. Now I wanted to share with you some tips and tricks that we use a lot and we see portfolio companies use very successfully on how to create urgency around your email. Like why should somebody meet with you? What's the forcing function? So some techniques that we'll use and we see portfolio companies use successfully time and again. Sometimes we use a geographic forcing function. So you're sending an email, you already have one email that's in Silicon Valley, you're going to be in San Jose, and the body of your email, you're saying maybe to the ABC News outlet or to a VC, you say, look, I'm from London, I'm from Tel Aviv, I'm from Philadelphia, I'm going to be in San Jose next week for uh, two days, I was wondering if you could get together. Sometimes that'll create urgency and open up the possibility of a meeting because somebody realizes you're in their town for a short period of time. And I've used this multiple times and use it all the time to try to pack out and fill out my days. And I find it's really, really helpful. Like I'm planning to be in Zurich in two weeks. I was wondering if you could get together for 20 minutes. And it's amazing how much calendars will open up when you're in a town for just a short period of time. That FOMO technique again creates urgency, the fear of missing out. I just met with X, Y, and Z. I was hoping we could get 20 minutes to just tell you what we've been talking to them about is another great way to create urgency. People don't want to miss out on the next big thing, right? So you're trying to show that you're the next big thing. We talked also about credibility, right? What's the credibility creates urgency? Look, I'm going to be outside Milan in Turin, Italy, and I'm meeting with Fiat, and I was wondering while I'm outside uh, Milan if I could uh, meet with you. We have huge credibility if you're meeting with a company like Fiat. Or I'm going to be in LA and I'm doing an interview with CBS News that night, and I was wondering, Mr. or Ms. VC, would you have time to meet with me? It's, gonna, it's going to create urgency and create a really interesting milieu about your company. And you're going to find you're going to get those meetings that are, are really, really important to help drive your business. Okay, so you've sent a great email, you got that first meeting, you modified your subject lines to figure out exactly when the date and time is going to be. Let's take it a step further and talk about great killer calendar entries to make sure it shows up on your calendar well, but again, most importantly, on your audience's calendar, the people that you're going to meet with and talk to. So here's some tricks and traps that we use at Dreamit every single day that we want you to use, please, also, because it's only going to be to your benefit. So the calendar entry, again, is going to be really specific when you do a calendar entry over email. So 
you want to have a specific subject line so it makes sense when it shows up on everyone else's calendar. I actually get calendar entries from today from other people and it shows up on my calendar and it shows meeting with Steve. Yes, I know. That's me. <laughs> I don't need to know that you're meeting with me. Who are you when I see it on my calendar if I've got 30 meetings that week and I'll have meeting weeks where I have 20, 30, 40 meetings in a week and I really want to know the exact details. So having a very specific subject line in your calendar entry is great to show who's going to be there for the meeting. Okay? And indicate that and the audience in the subject line itself. In most modern calendar systems, there's a detailed location information field. Make sure to use that. What's the address? What's the suite? What's the floor? You're rushing into a meeting. You're in a foreign city. You have to go into something. And wait, where's that? What's the address? What's the suite? What's the floor? You're scrambling through email. Make it easier for you. Make it easier for your recipient. If you're going to have a phone call and you're going to put the phone number in, how many times have you had a conference call and you're, wait, what's the conference line? What's the conference number? So for a phone call, make sure to detail in the calendar entry who is calling who. Right? You get that classic, wait, are they calling me or am I calling them? What's the exact phone number you're using? If you're using a conferencing service, make sure to call, include the conference number, include the bridge number. And these all seem so simple, but I see so many calendar trees that I get and other entrepreneurs send, and they're all so weak. It's missing this key information. I've literally had people over the last five or ten years say to me, it's like, it's such a pleasure to do business with you because you make it so easy to meet and interact with you. And it's little things like this can make a huge difference and make you stand out and look highly professional and get those meetings that you want. Also, a lot of times I'll take the body of the email and copy it into the notes for the calendar entry. So when I'm walking into the meeting, I can look down in the notes section. It refreshes my mind what we're meeting about. Same thing for the recipient. So if you're going to do all of that work to get that meeting and get in there, make sure the calendar entry is just as good as the email that you sent. Okay, we've talked a lot about great emails and great calendar entries. I wanted to go into a little etiquette if you're, if you're going to be an email ninja to make sure you follow that proper ninja etiquette. So the first thing is, something that's kind of a little bit annoying to me, is if people are CCing each other, just make sure to reply all when somebody CCs so you don't break the CC chain, right? So just, it's I think a nice thing to do. If somebody puts three or four people on an email, unless you have a very specific reason, make sure to reply all and keep everybody into the conversation thread, unless there's a very deliberate reason. So that's the etiquette on CCs. Let's talk about BCCs, right? Blind carbon copy is what that stands for if you're, if you're not sure. So here's a general rule of what I want you to do. You should never, ever BCC someone. I've had this happen in my career a couple times where people have BCC'd me and I do a reply all and I come out of hiding and don't look that smart when I do that or particularly the sender who originally sent it and did that, like they didn't mean me to reply to it. Don't BCC people. It's a very, very dangerous thing. I'll give you one example of when you should do it. Okay, so you should never BCC someone unless you're moving them to BCC and letting other people know. So what I mean by that is sometimes somebody will do an intro to me and I'll say, you know what, Bob, thanks for the intro, moving you to BCC to keep your inbox clear. I will do that overtly and let everybody know I'm doing that and then continue the conversation. That's the one time you can BCC. Otherwise, don't do it. It's a very dangerous technique. What you should do if you want somebody to see a copy of your email, Take the email from your sent and forward it to them, but don't BCC unless you're openly, overtly moving someone to BCC. We've been talking a lot about etiquette and being an email ninja. Let's talk about the etiquette specifically around asking for introductions. At Dreamit, people ask us for introductions all day long to the point that we're almost like an introduction factory. I want you to think about how you can do introductions for yourselves. More importantly, when, not when you're working with Dreamit, but when you're working with customers and partners and you're asking for introductions, how do you do that highly effectively as an email ninja? You don't want to make more work for other people. So if you want an intro, do the work. Let's say you're in a meeting, you're talking to a potential customer and they have somebody else that you could talk to. So you can say to them, look, how about I'll send you a really brief overview and I'll put a reminder in there of the email uh, intro that you offered and just make it really easy for them. Make that email in such a fashion that they can take your email and immediately forward. It just makes it easy for them. If you want to be a true email ninja and walk on rice paper and not leave marks, think about doing a self-intro with permission. So we do this a lot. I'll be in a meeting with someone and I'll say, you know, are there two other, three other people you think in this healthcare system that we should talk to? They'll mention two or three people and I'll say to that person, if you're okay with it, 
you know what, I'll do a self intro to those other people. I'll figure out their email address, that's not hard. If that's okay with you, I'll CC you on that email, I'll mention you in the subject line, but I just don't wanna make more work for you. So if you're cool with that, I'll just do a self intro and CC you on it. I find nine times out of 10 people say yes, and that means I get to do all the work, I don't have to wait on them, I don't have to send them an email and wait three days and ask for the intro again. Just think about doing self intros. You're gonna find it moves the conversations along much, much faster and it makes it so much better on the people that you're working with. So we spent a bunch of time today talking about how to make you an email ninja. Let's talk about the key takeaways from all of this. It starts with creating a rich LinkedIn profile and using LinkedIn to break the ice. Remember, modifying the standard LinkedIn, I wanna connect with a very specific message to get it accepted. So that's how you break the ice. Then create a killer subject line in your email that's really compelling that gets your email opened. Have a concise, credible, compelling body that's as short as possible that people are gonna read through quickly that doesn't look like too long didn't read. Make scheduling with you really easy. Suggest dates and times to get together and meet with you. Modify the subject line of your email to keep it moving along and not getting buried in conversations. And remember, not only sending great calendar invites as part of scheduling, but we talked about the etiquette about replying to CCs, don't BCC unless you're doing it overtly, and we also talked about great techniques on how to do intros, how to ask for intros, and how to self-intro. Thanks for watching today our presentation on breaking through via emails. I'm Steve Barsh, Chief Innovation Officer of Dreamit. If you have questions or additional things that you've learned about how to break through an email, let us know, put it to great use, and good luck.